Yeah, good evening to everybody on uh, behalf of IAP TNC. I welcome uh, Anada. And first, we will start with the pediatrician prayer. Kulandai Marutubani Niranjidal. Engal Kamulumiana Gunamalikum Ternai Tarum. Noirin Tunbam Dirkum Teran Namaka Valanga Pata, the Pudipata Serapurime and by the Padiburanam Norwa Maha. Ella Kulandai Lakum, our them Kudumbati Nerkum. Our Glen Samurai Padinale Matum Sadi Mada Privile Paramal. Nalam Katral Ige Anbu Amidi I gave it in Tutu or Laga and Rumirpo Maha. Namal Mudinavatri Matravum, Nalavatri Ulbangavum, Matra Mudia Navatri, Karnathuran Etrikolabum, Pothamana Meyerimum, Puridalam Engel Kalangiga, Mulla Walter Layum, Arlayum, Karnayum, Ella Kulandi, Ella Solar Galilum, Erangalilum, Anit Maklade, Kurta Arlinga. Thank you. Now I invite our dynamic president, Dr. Ismail Sat, to deliver a presence letters. Thank you, Dr. Rajendra, the respected chairperson, Dr. SBS, sir. Moderators, Dr. Sneha Worki and my good friend, Dr. Anthony, and all the respected judges and the delegates today. I'm very happy indeed. You're you are all fortunate today because we are going to have the three leading players today, like uh, Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Salah playing today in the match. I think all three doyens of pediatrics are going to share their wisdom and knowledge to you. And the delegates are really fortunate today. I'm very happy and wish you all a happy learning. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your nice words. And on behalf of IAP TNC, it's my duty to introduce our chairperson, Dr. I.S.P. Sir, yes, Bala Subramaniam. He's a medical director and uh, at uh, Kanji Kamakodi Church Trust. And Suri NK number top chat, I know everybody and need not have an introduction. And I welcome uh, I.S.P. Sir. And I welcome today's moderator, Dr. Snega Varki. He's a professor of pediatrics at Christian Medical College, and he has done a lot of studies in cystic fibrosis also, and a lot of obligation regarding this one. I welcome Dr. Snega. I welcome Dr. Anthony Terence. He's a consultant pediatric pulmonologist and a leading pulmonologist in Crime 2. And his interventional procedure is doing a lot of interventional in pediatric pulmonology. And he is currently in um, GKNM Hospital and Coimto. And I welcome uh, today's uh, judges, Dr. Um, uh, LLRC Madam Bala Sankar and uh, Dr. Janan Shankar and uh, PRC Sir and Dr. Srinivasan Sir from Party. And I welcome today's um, uh, postgraduates uh, from uh, Kanjigao Magadi Children's Hospital, Dr. Anvita and uh, Dr. Manoj and Vamsi. And, uh, uh, they are definitely they, today this will be a good presentation and uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Uh, S.P. Sir. And I welcome all the judges and as well as the delegates also. Now I request our uh, uh, chairperson, Dr. Uh, uh, S.P. Sir, to tell a few words and uh, follow by we can start it. Thank you, Dr. Rajendran. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, Today, actually, uh, one of our postgraduates, uh, Dr. Anvita, is going to discuss uh, a case. Uh, uh, we are very fortunate that we have uh, uh, two, I would say, middle order uh, experts, uh, one from CMC Velour and one from Pamtu, Dr. Sneha and Dr. Anthony, uh, to carry on the discussion. Um, I would not interfere much uh, because uh, I want the wisdom of these two moderators to percolate to the younger generation who have listened to me time and again. I do not want to bore them again. I will come in only if it's only when it is absolutely necessary. So it's over to, and uh, you know, the, the Dr. Anvita, who's going to discuss the case, has discussed this case with me because it, <laughs> several times uh, I, uh, it will be very natural if these two experts discuss the case and take this forward. Over to Dr. Anvita, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Sneha and Dr. Anthony Terence, if you have anything to say to begin with, if you have any particular plans, you please let us know before Dr. Anvita starts. Welcome Dr. Sneha and Dr. Anthony Terence. And of course, Dr. Anvita Manoj and Mamsi. Anvita, please share your slides. No, 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 Dr. Sneha is about to talk, Rajin. Yes, yeah, Sneha, please. No, uh, nothing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll go straight to the case and then discuss. 
Thank you again. Dr. Anthony. Yeah, I think uh, we'll go to the case. Uh, it's a privilege <laughs> to be under Dr. SPS, and I think he'll also, you know, like uh, shower his wisdom today on this particular question. Yeah. Dr. Anvira, please share your slides. Anvira. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Anvita is a second year DNB postgraduate. Very quiet, efficient, and extremely sincere and dedicated. Great yes. privilege indeed. Start your presentation. Start. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today I am presenting a case of infant presenting with skin rash and cough. <coughs> one if correction, I... Anvita. One correction, Anvita. Uh, yes, sir. Your presentation. I never interfered with your presentation. Okay, remove the term guidance because it is your show and you have done extremely well. I've gone through the slides. Without my guidance, you have prepared extremely well. Please go ahead. I don't, I shouldn't take credit for it. Okay, sir. Uh, starting with the case, uh, a four month old female infant, first born to non consumerist married parents with no significant antenatal and perinatal history, is brought by her mother, whose reliability is good with chief complaints of skin rash for three weeks and cough for three days. History of presenting illness, uh, skin rash uh, since three weeks, erythematous macula, uh, macular rash, which started in the lower limb, progressively increasing in, uh, increasing to involved trunk and upper limb. Uh, the rash is not blanchable, no local rise of temperature is there, and there is no mucocutaneous involvement. Cough is there for three days, which is sudden in onset, not associated with noisy breathing, no diurnal or post postural variations, no aggravating or relieving factors. Uh, the child was first initially treated on OPD basis with topical steroids. In view of increasing skin rash, she was admitted and evaluated for the same. Uh, there was no complaint of fever, uh, no history of vomiting or regurgitation of fits, no history of drug intake, no history of allergy, no complaint of similar illness in the past, uh, no complaint of jaundice, no complaint of diarrhea, <laughs> There was no history of previous hospitalizations. Antenatal history uh, uh, registered an immunized case, no history of maternal illness or infections or drug intake. Natal history, she is a normal uh, uh, full term delivery, cried immediately after birth. Birth weight was 2.7 kgs, no history of NICU admissions. Postnatal history uh, started breastfeeding within two hours, passed during and meconium within 24 hours, exclusively breastfed uh, for four months. Developmental history, she had, uh, has attained social smile and neck holding. Family history, uh, it's a non consanguineous marriage, first by birth order, no family history of TB. Immunization history, immunized still age according to IAP schedule. Uh, general examination, uh, baby is alert. There is arithmetic skin rash present over lower limbs, trunk, and upper limbs. Anisarka is present. No pallor, icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, or lymphadenopathy. BCG scar is present. Anthropometry wise, weight is 5 kg. Yes, yes, Anvita, 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 sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, uh, it's fair that at the end of the history, uh, uh, Dr. Sneha and uh, Anthony would certainly uh, would like to analyze the history uh, uh, along with you and perhaps uh, want more details. Is that all right, Dr. Sneha and Terence, or you want to go ahead? No, no, sir. We'll actually stop in the history and discuss and then proceed further. Yeah. Anthony, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, the history was quite good. And what was the chief complaint that uh, brought the patient to the hospital or to the clinician? What was the chief complaint? Uh, so the chief complaint was skin rash, sir. Uh, skin rash since three weeks. Uh, initially, it was there only in the lower limb, and it was gradually increasing, involving trunk and upper limb. Okay. And uh, you said, uh, what, what kind of rash is it? Is it a erythematous? Uh, Rash? Uh, yes, sir. It was a macular erythematous rash, uh, which was not blanching on pressure and uh, non palpable, sir. Okay, and uh, predominantly involving, you said the lower limbs, but um, anything on the face? 
uh, no sir initially it started in the lower limbs and it gradually progressed to involve trunk and upper limbs and uh, when you got the history what are the things you will think about when you like uh, you know uh, hear such kind of history about rash what are the things you want to explore further from the history the history uh, first i'll ask for the complaint of any fever sir uh, coexisting fever along with the skin rash okay for uh, in case there is fever you will be thinking about an infectious cause you know as a reason for the rash uh, okay. i guess sir and if it is uh, with fever uh, what are the things you last here there is no fever probably um, what are the things uh, we will consider this uh, you know if it is a infectious this infectious uh, any viral infection sir probably you will last about any contact you know if it is a chicken pox or some other you know exactly but the illness probably we think about any contact the family or any anyone the, you know coming Uh, to the house, uh, you know, the, that is not very clear. There is some echo. I don't know whether you're using two this thing. Yeah. Hello. Hello. No, it's okay, Anthony. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Here, uh, it's not an infectious. You know, what are the things uh, we have to think about in this particular rash, especially if it's associated with the cough? Uh, viral example, sir. No, we we actually already discussed you know viral exanthems and definitely if there is a viral exanthem you know uh, there might be a contact and you can also get in bacterial infections you know like uh, staphylococcal infection or those things in this particular age group you know that will be one of your differential diagnosis if there is any fever therefore infection as a cause for rash we have discussed what other things non infectious causes in this particular age group vasculitis uh, is a possibility sir Yes, uh, you know, vasculitis. You don't see uh, much, but uh, it might be a rare cause. I have not seen much of vasculitis in this particular age group. But what are the things like um, uh, non, you know, non-infectious cause for the rash? Probably. Yeah, drug history of any drug intake we need to rule out, sir. Yeah, definitely. That will be one of the things. You know, that could be non-infectious and. What are the things? Common things. Uh, it could be something, you know, uh, could be an atopic rash. That's something we commonly see, you know, like atopic rash. Please uh, okay. come across a condition called atopic dermatitis. Yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, is it common to this particular age group? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, and uh, what kind of rash they get actually, like uh, an atopic dermatitis? uh eczema eczematous rash rash eczematous rash and um, usually over the cheeks and uh, you know you can get over the lower limbs as well and uh, you know older kids you know can complain of uh, irrit uh, itching but this age group they will be you know very irritable if they have you know atopic uh, dermatitis therefore yes. that's one thing we have to keep in mind atopic dermatitis because the child having cough and uh, in case if you think about atopic dermatitis what are the history will ask hello 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 yeah. you have mentioned nicely the child is you know being the infant is being exclusively breastfed okay therefore uh, yes, we have to ask about any cow's milk cow's milk intake cow's yes, milk yes. intake okay that's one of the things but we have seen some babies even with breast milk the mum is you know having uh, lots of you know mum is uh, having just in the high, you know having cow's milk uh, you know even if the baby is not taking cow's milk still the baby can have cow's milk allergy and atopic dermatitis but that's quite rare okay that's for okay, cow's see. milk so cow's milk protein allergy you know and atopic dermatitis should be one of your differential diagnosis in this particular child especially the child has got a cough and what are the things like um, non infectious we can think about nutritional causes you know like if a child is small nourished the child can have associated vitamin deficiencies and micronutrient deficiencies that can also result in rash therefore we have discussed infectious as well as non infectious causes for rash okay, and um, from whatever history you know like uh, you have put forward to which group that you are in you are a patient a non infectious sir more like a non infectious yeah and um, 
can you just uh, go back to your cough and uh, explain more about your cough? Because uh, I'm very interested in the cough as well. Okay, sir. Uh, there was a cough uh, which was there for three days, uh, which was suddenly in onset and more of a wet cough. It was not associated with noisy breathing, no diurnal or postural variations, no aggravating or relieving factors. Okay. And what are the history that will be very important in this particular age group? When you want to ask about this, good, you know, mentioned is a wet cough. It's very, very important. Sometimes, uh, you know, parents were, won't be able to tell whether it's a dry cough or a wet cough. And in those situations, we actually ask the baby, you know, uh, we listen to the baby while in the clinic, you know, until the baby coughs. And, uh, and if it is an older kid, we ask the, you know, the child to cough and uh, to assess the nature of the cough. Sometimes parents might not be very accurate. They, they might not be very clear in what they, you know, uh, mean. Therefore, uh, you have mentioned very clearly it's a wet cough, okay? And uh, like uh, have a history of wet cough and what will be your differential diagnosis in this particular, you know? It's a very acute cough, you know? It's very, very difficult to tell at this point of time. But uh, when you consider wet cough, what are the things that will come to your mind? Uh, lung infection, sir, lung abscess. Uh, wet cough, probably it's not going to be upper respiratory problem. It's going to be a lower respiratory problem. That's the first thing, you know, like, that will strike you. If it is a wet cough, Dr. Sneha, you want to proceed from here? I'm talking too much. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, I, you finished? Or... Uh, I will just carry on from here, I will, uh, the cough, yeah. Okay, so um, you have discussed very well with uh, Dr. Anthony about the history. Now, if we could just take, take a step back if you think of this baby born to a set of, I presume, young parents, everything was going good, right? That's I mean, not. no antenatal problem, no perinatal problem. Baby is born with a very good weight. And mother is exclusively breastfeeding. Excellent scenario, right? Everything what we want the family to do is going on. And then uh, at the age of maybe three months and a little beyond that, the baby develops a skin rash. So you have discussed all those causes for the different reasons why this baby can have skin rash. So when it is go persisting for three weeks, so then it gets a bit out of hand. That is not what you expect in this context. So there is immediately, there is something wrong there. Okay, so recognizing that there is something is really going wrong in this patient is the first, first point here. So we need to go a little bit depth, you know, look around for what could go wrong. So some of the differential diagnosis has been discussed now. With regards to cough, in this last three, four months, it's been raining like this here. Everybody has a cough. So cough for three days, maybe just, you know, just part of anybody could be having a cough, bronchiolitis. They may describe it as a wet cough because it sounds a bit wet. So, that, I mean, you already discussed some of the, uh, you know, features of the cough. That's fine. So can I ask you to think again about what else do you want to ask? So when a baby has an ongoing rash in the context of a child who seems to be well in the initial part, was there anything else going wrong? What, what else would you ask? Was there anything else? Now you need to probe because we can't just, this is unusual for a rash to go on for three weeks now. What else would you want to know? So what is the most, you know, the, the what is what, what the one point the pediatricians are after? Yeah. Always. That's what they want to know first. Yeah. The growth, isn't it? Uh, How is the baby growing? That is the first thing, you know, that is like a crystal ball for us. Baby is growing well, you know, everything is fine. Baby is not growing well, we have to stop. There is something really, really wrong. How is the growth of this baby? Uh, growth was normal. Weight gain was adequate. Otherwise, no, well thriving child. No. So you said a baby was born with 2.7 kg. And what would you expect the weight to be now? Uh, around 6 kg. No. Okay. So the baby must have gone for vaccination two times. What was uh, the weight at that time? You need to ask. So you may not uh, have asked. Not. So... Uh, growing well, maybe just the mother's opinion, the baby is growing well, you need to ask that question, because that will reassure you as to the uh, severity of whatever problem you're facing now. Okay, so okay. if the baby is growing well, and a rash appeared, you know, infection or something which is uh, A2P, it can happen. But if it's not baby has been struggling with something, you know, either the feeding, you know, uh, bringing out or vomiting a lot of feeds, 
or not growing well, then you have to think of some other causes also. What could that be? Like, you know, the nutrition is, is going in, but the baby is not growing well. If it, that is the situation, what else would you, would you consider? Uh, since uh, intake is good, but uh, still is good. some malabsorption may be possible. Okay, malabsorption or the utilization is not, uh, either it's not getting absorbed or it is absorbed and it is wasted in some way, right? So uh, that is very important. So inborn errors of metabolisms also can present with rash. Some typical rashes can be there. So all, so this is very important, the nutrition, how the baby has been growing, how is the sleep of the baby? Is there excessive crying, irritability, uh, you know, any of, so now we have to probe further because we can't just go by what the mother said, just two, two problems. I mean, I got a glimpse of your uh, examination because you said there was edema. Looks like mother hadn't noticed that. So, uh, yes, so mother is missing a few things in the history, some things she hasn't brought out. So it's for you to probe. And also, if you have done the examination, if you got a clue, that's for you to probe now. Because once you, you get past this history, you don't have a chance to come back here. You can't come back and explain or tell us, you know, by the way, this was there or this was not there. So whatever you got from the his, uh, examination, you, can't, you can bring it to perspective here and give us more history of it was there, it was not there. So, yeah. Anything else you want to say now? So, I mean, I just got, saw your first slide. So there were some important points there. That's why I'm taking you back into the history now again. You want to, uh, can you show us the first slide? I, first I slide in the examination, yeah. I, I think uh, shall we just ask her to summarize, you know, whatever she has said, no? Yeah. So summary of history, that yeah. would be like, yeah. yeah. Uh, four month old uh, infant, uh, first born to non consanguineous parents, uh, parents presenting with uh, skin rash since three weeks and cough uh, since three days, uh, with well thriving, uh, with uh, adequate weight gain. Uh, my uh, differential diagnosis would be non infective cause, probable uh, some small absorption related disorders. Um, you have like a uh, weight. Are you happy with the weight? Like, uh, uh, because this slide is examination slide, uh, we just want to know what is, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's not a very chronic illness. It's like uh, from the history, it's like more of a, you know, three week uh, illness. And previously, you know, everything seems to be okay. But uh, it's a very important, uh, you know, even though the history might not be say it's chronic, uh, the impact of on growth and development will definitely tell you it's, uh, whether it's a chronic problem or a chronic problem. And uh, are you happy with the weight? You know, whenever, uh, you know, like happy with the weight, uh, parents say like, you know, because this is the first baby, sometimes it's difficult for them to compare with the other, other baby. If they have already have, you know, babies, probably they can compare with the previous sibling. But uh, for them, it will be very difficult. But uh, uh, are you sure they are not concerned about the weight? Uh, sir, actually, I think because the baby had anasarka, uh, parents were not sure, uh, like, uh, that anasarka uh, weight loss or weight inadequate weight gain was masked by anasarka, probably. Okay. Therefore, but yet, that was not a complaint. That's strange, isn't it? So they didn't notice the anasarka as a problem. They were only concerned about the rash. Yeah, you can uh, go on. Yeah, that, that's a bit like, you know, so her history, you know, we have to, uh, maybe her understanding of what is going on wrong, she didn't grasp it quick enough. Yeah. You, you can go on to the next slide. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Anvita, just one comment. I think your anthropometry, not mentioning head circumference, is not acceptable. Oh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony and Dr. Uh, Sneha, uh, this is a doctor's relative child, so I'm not showing the pictures of the okay. child. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, Anvita, can you go to the examination, the first slide onwards of the examination? Let's go stepwise. Yeah, okay. Go back. And mentioned uh, the head circle. Examination. Sure you have yeah, that's where you are. Yeah. Oh. So this is your first impression. Yeah. Next. 
uh, baby is alert there is erythematous skin rash present over lower limbs trunk and upper limbs anesar ka was there no paler or icterus or cyanosis or clapping or lymphadenopathy bcg scar is present and the on uh, anthropometry weight is 5 kg uh, between first and third centile uh, length is 60 cm so between third and fifth percentile uh vitals heart rate was 98 per minute respiratory rate was 36 per minute bp was 117 temperature was normal uh examination findings uh systemic examination wise uh respiratory system there was no distress or tachypnea uh bilateral normal vascular breath sounds were there cardiac system wise normal s1 s2 was heard no murmur was there parabdomen wise liver was palpable 3 cm and the right costal margin uh which was firm in consistency and non tender and no other mass was palpable uh and cns wise stone power reflexes were normal there was no focal neurological deficit okay uh, so anvita uh, uh so you got some important findings in right up in the general examination right yes, anasaka yes. so that's not something which you expect in a 4 month old baby whether the mother mentioned that or not that's abnormal so do you want to step back and review your uh, you know differentials versus what will cause anasarca in a small young baby so because that has some implications on the examination there may be lots more to examine pointedly like you know you have to look for these features if you find anasarca in a baby because that's that's you are taking it to a very extreme situation right now since uh, uh, since anasarca uh, skin rash was also coexisting with anasarca uh, probable langer langer hansel histiocytosis would be a differential diagnosis ma no like uh, yeah that's one of the things but uh, um, what are the common you know what is undergraduate teaching when you see a edematous baby what are the problems baby can have like when you see edematous baby uh, what kind of edema must we can expect like uh pitting or non pitting types no pitting and non pitting but uh, what are the things uh, the conditions that will produce edema what is the reason for edema how can uh, why is some or uh, mechanism of edema how, how will develop the edema uh either be either it could be decreased the synthesis of the proteins ma'am uh, or proteins can be synthesized but they are uh, not absorbed or proteins may be lost um uh, okay of... that is about protein oh, any other reason why you can have edema i mean if it's not anasarca is one thing any other reason let just take it as a broad thing you know uh, some edema of multiple parts of the body so what else leave the protein aside protein we will discuss but what else what, will cause what other systems will lead to edema any congestive cardiac failure yes yeah. can cause yeah you make a comment if you don't mind yeah dr bala will you allow me yes sir yes yeah i'm surprised that uh, parents unless very uneducated that uh, child is having anasarca and they didn't complain about it very unusual especially when a child is having 15 days rashes they'll be very keen to notice whatever change is happening so i was surprised that uh, there was no mention about uh, parents telling about sudden uh, swelling or so i was wondering whether it was true properly it's actually to set the record uh, correct uh, the edema appeared very rapidly and not in serious this was actually a well baby and in fact though she has put the centile as a first to third centile for a baby with a birth weight of 2.7 kg a 5 kg at about 3 and a half months is acceptable you the on plot on plotting it is in the same centile head size is okay length was acceptable and it was a well baby but for the rashes uh, it was a well baby except that there was some concern about the cheeks that to that to the mother has chubby cheeks so child had a chubby cheek but definitely did not have edema anywhere and uh, was a well baby except those rashes and the, whatever edema had hap- that had happened had happened only uh, in a weeks time in a weeks time not uh, 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 very early very early 
and uh, to correct anvita when you have edema you have to go back to the fundamentals of pathology edema can occur due to several reasons right and cardiac failure is not the commonest cause at all in this age group that's something which you must remember four month old baby in cardiac failure <laughs> doesn't present with the edema. If it is present with the edema, it is going to present with the edema. It will be in ICU or it will be in the deathbed. It is very unusual. That's something you must remember. Cardiac is not common. Okay, sir. Much more common are the other causes. In fact, if you take the newborn who has edema, you must remember starting from the first uh, cause. It is the preterm physiological edema that is the commonest uh, cause of edema in the newborn. And it can be external, it can be renal, it can be hepatic, it can be cardiac, or it may be vasculopathy or third spacing. That's what we are seeing in dengue, right? Yes, so uh, it can be anything. It can be anything. It can involve, it can, it can be due to any systemic disorder. And in this child, edema had occurred. I don't think you can straight away come to a conclusion this edema is due to malabsorption because there is nothing else in the history which has given you a clue that something is going wrong, except maybe you were biased because you felt that the 5 kg, 5 kg at three and a half months, I, 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 for a baby who's breastfed 2.7 kg, I wouldn't have diagnosed nutritional edema at this age group. That's, that's not the common, but that's how the scenario evolves. You should look at the causes of edema in, the, in a different perspective and try to find out what is the likely cause in this child. Right? Okay. And Manoj, Manoj and Bamsi are keeping quiet. What do you think is, is the differential diagnosis for this edema of all the all that I mentioned? I mentioned so many causes. In fact, if you if you look at the newborn causes of edema, it includes IV fluids, ventilation, acrodermatitis, Turner syndrome, and so on and so forth. Right? Hydro, starting from hydroxytalic. In this baby, you should do as it. Now, I'm going to ask Manoj to get in and tell us okay. what could be the cause for the edema in this child. Uh, sir, uh, going through the entire presented, uh, looks no, more like a hepatic. You know more details about the case. Don't go back from what you know about this case today. You At that okay. point of time, a baby who has had some skin rash and who had come yes, to you with some edema and some cough duration and the edema of only say one week duration with the parameters that you are that that uh, uh, Anvita is giving what do you think are, are the differential diagnosis at this point of time over to Anthony and Dr. Sneha um, uh, from the investigative findings hepatic cause look like more common sir. Uh, I think we analyze each and every cause separately, you know, from top to bottom. Probably what will be your, Sarah has already said, if the patient has come to, uh, come to me when I was doing post-graduation, we were thinking about a nutritional cause like wash your car. But, uh, you know, therefore nutritional, but this baby is being breastfed. Therefore, very unlikely, you know, like uh, a child to have a nutritional cause for edema. Previously, you know, the baby is, you know, like... Uh, is a formula fed, very diluted milk. Probably you have, you can think about a nutritional cause. Therefore, nutritional, do you think um, is possible in this baby? Nutritional? Very unlikely, you know? Yeah, it's very unlikely. What about, next thing is, once your baby is taking a feed, feeds adequately, next thing we'll think about is malnutrition because uh, there is a rash. Therefore, I think I'll, uh, the malabsorption, I'll, I'll ask more about the malabsorption thing as well in this baby because, um, Rash is something uh, pointer, you know, in case if there is an edema. Therefore, what are the things you'll ask uh, and what will you examine uh, while you examine the baby with regards to malabsorption? Starting from malabsorption. The hair, we have to, to look at the, what is the hair, color hair, uh, hair of the uh, brittle skin, uh, brittle hair or there, or any dermato, any uh, dermatosis. Yeah, but, there. Yeah, I agree with that skin and uh, other change. Apart from that, with regards to malabsorption, uh, what are the things you can actually have a look at? Uh, other vitamin deficiencies you have to look Not at. very educated and very informative. What they describe might not be good. Uh, you know, uh, it's important to look at the stools, you know, like uh, if you there's a neonatal polyostasis, you look at the stool, you make the diagnosis. Like that, this is one condition where you have to look at the stool. Oily stools, uh, bulky white stools, sir. 
Yeah, therefore, if it is a mole absorption, if it is a fat mole absorption, probably you might get a greasy or, you know, oily right. stools. You know, it might not be there all the time, but uh, stools might be. Because most of the time, sometimes what happens is they come with diarrhea as well. So, you know, you can't make out the typical oily, greasy stools. But uh, did anyone examine or have had a chance to look at the stools of this baby? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So oh. There was uh, no history of passage of oily or bulky stools. Did you, did you have a, ha, had a look at the stools? Like, ah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, but you find it, you didn't find anything abnormal with that. Ah, uh, no, sir. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Actually, I examined. You had a look at the stools because when I did my postgraduate examination, my case was neonatal cholestasis. Therefore, at that time, they will ask even to do a cut section of the stools to look at the color of the stools. Just just in a lighter vein, Dr. Anthony, in my postgraduates will uh, would have seen me do that. You know what I do in such cases? I ask them to pack the stool like Sarona bone parcel or Swiggy and come and show me the next day. That's the best way to look at the stool. Most of the time it's not looked at and this, stool, this baby stool is normal. Just to go ahead, see Dr. Anvita and Dr. Vamsi, see, I mentioned so many causes of edema. Even without touching the baby, you can come to the conclusion where the problem is. I'll tell you how. This is not a sick baby with severe illness. So third spacing is absolutely not on my cards. You follow what I'm saying, Dr. Anvita? Yes, sir. This not a sick baby with sepsis and severe illness. So third spacing is not something which I'm going to think of, number one. Number two, as I mentioned here, cardiac wise normal and there is no respiratory distress, such edema. No, it's not cardiac. Third, renal. Again, I would have, this baby would have had more of periorbital edema rather than fetal edema and abdominal distension, like what you're describing. Renal is extremely, extremely unlikely, and I'm sure you would have got a history of oliguria if the edema is going to be so severe, something like congenital nephrotic syndrome in this baby. It's out on my cards. Third. Fourth is liver disease. Liver disease causing so much of anasarka, okay? So much of anasarka, no jaundice, and nothing happening to the stool color or to the urine color and baby otherwise okay not ill looking and no seizures neurologically nothing else is happening i mean again it doesn't look likely i'm not saying 100 percent not there so i am left with some other thing either it is nutritional nutritional in a baby who's breastfed like dr anthony said you don't find Quashaker in a four-month-old baby, right? The only area of concern is this baby has got a skin rash and edema. So whether this is a nutritional dermatosis, where that gives you a clue, this nutritional dermatosis and the edema may be due to a pathology in the bowel. May be due to a pathology in the bowel. And, uh, you know, you're not going to think of angioneurotic edema in this child as a cause for anasarka. This baby is not being ventilated. And, uh, you know, it's not lower limb edema to think of Turner syndrome. So, having put all the cards together, even here, it looks very likely that there is a problem in the bowel, in spite of the absence of diarrhea, in spite of absence of any GI symptom, that there is something happening in the bowel which is leading to probably hypoproteinemia in spite of breastfeeding and probably leading to some nutritional dermatosis. Okay, then the dermatosis, if you look at it, if you look at cause of dermatosis, either it is infection or allergy or nutritional or metabolic, right? So this doesn't look like atopy exclusively breastfed infant. It doesn't look like infection. It doesn't look like a metabolic disorder so far because nothing else seems to be happening. So I think, again, nutrition comes in here. So nutritional dermatosis, anasarka, the culprit must be the bowel rather than anything else. Over to Sneha and Anthony. I missed the discussion a bit because I got signed out. Uh, Anthony, please take over. I'll come in when I have gathered where we, we are. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I think you have, sir, SBS sir, you have explained everything in very detail. Actually, the next thing I, I was about to you know, tell that without jaundice, you know, like the child is very unlikely to have a hepatic edema. You know, we are not seeing, you know, anectric jaundice and you know, hypovolemia edema. It's very, very, very rare actually. And uh, as you said, renal, you know, will be very obvious, and uh, the edema progression will be from, first from face to tummy and then legs. Therefore, like um, very unlikely uh, to be a renal or hepatic problem. Nutritional, you know, being breastfed, it's very unlikely. Therefore, I think uh, uh, everything points towards some intestinal pathology. Yeah, I'll, I'll invite the presenter to proceed further. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and read that. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, in the end of the uh, systemic examination, uh, uh, summing up all, uh, four month old female infant first born to non consumerous marriage uh, with history of skin rash since three weeks and cough since three days, uh, uh, and with the cherubic faces, anasarka, and hepatomegaly. Uh, my differential diagnosis would be probable metabolic liver disorder or uh, probable Langer Hansel histocytosis or probable protein losing entropathy. Uh, yeah, so that seems to be a good uh, differential diagnosis to work with. So uh, suppose this baby was a little more older, like, you know, uh, let's say 10 months or one year, close to one year. Uh, what could be the reason for, like, you know, if it is a protein related, you know, low albumin causing um, edema and all these features, uh, what will be the common reason? What could be more, more possible? If the baby was older. Yes, Anvita or Lucy, uh, please, please go ahead. What happened? Manoj? Um, Ma'am. Older children, hypoalbuminemia, uh, nephrotic will be higher up in the list. Okay. Can that happen in a young baby too? Four months old? It, it can, ma'am. It can. I mean, can congenital happen. nephrotic syndrome can nephrotic happen. Syndrome it can be there. Yes, but uh, close to one year, you know, that's the time when weaning is inadequate or problems related to nutrition can happen. Yes, so your weightage is more for uh, some kind of a improper weaning and nutritional causes. Uh, nephrotic syndrome can be sometimes intestinal infections and secondary to that, some kind of a chronic infection and secondary to that, some absorption problems can happen. That will again, if that is happening again, that will raise our eyebrows again, like as to why that is happening to this baby. Is there anything with the immunity or uh, you know things like uh, celiac disease or inflammation, chronic inflammation, which is leading. But here we are talking about a very small baby, four months. So some of this differential diagnosis are I mean, four month old exclusively breastfed baby. So the common things which we consider in pediatrics doesn't really apply at this point because it's a four month. So we, we have very few differential diagnosis to consider. And most of that will be something congenital rather than something which is acquired in the last three weeks. So this baby is born with something and this baby is presenting just two, three, three months later. Okay, so our weightage is more for something congenital than something which has gone on in the environment. Uh, yes, Please go ahead, Anita. Uh, uh, yes, uh, on evaluation, our uh, investigations are as follows. Uh, Hemoglobin was 7.2 gram per deciliter. Total leukocyte was 10,300 with a neutrophil count of 38 and a lymphocyte count of 59. Uh, platelet was 3.74 uh, 3 lakhs. CRP was negative. Uh, total bilirubin was 0.4 with a direct component of 0.4. SGOT was 72, SGPT was 54. Albumin was 2.1 gram per deciliter. Serum alkaline phosphatase was 415 with a GG2 of uh, 211. Uh, PT was prolonged more than 120 seconds. APTT was also prolonged more than 120 seconds. And INO couldn't be calculated. And renal function tests were normal. Okay. 
Any, Anita, yeah. Anita uh, sorry. Oh, yes, ma'am. This uh, results come as a big surprise from your clinical finding because HP is 7.2 grams. Yes, so that was not obvious on your examination? Uh, no, ma'am. Again, yes. albumin 2.1 is, you know, in an acute infection, sometimes albumin drops, drops, but, you know, two point is, I mean, we mentioned anasarca, so that was, you know, something was there before and hemoglobin is also on the lower side. For four months, 7.2, you know, we are sitting at the real borderline there. Right. And PT and PTT being, you know, this is dangerously prolonged, right? Yes, so, I mean, when you see this, you will go back and look for something you might have missed in the skin or somewhere. Uh, this is extremely prolonged. So again, you know, well, when you take history, you don't have to be, uh, even for exam, when you take history, you don't have to go right in order like a first, first year student takes, you know, you will take presenting history, then past history, in, strictly in that order. When you get a clue from somewhere, you can go back and probe and find out what's going on. So this kind of PT, PTT, it may be an acute problem. It may be some infection which is causing this kind of a derangement. If it is like we discussed something within the baby congenitally, which was there manifesting three months later, you know, during vaccination, what happened? Was there any, any bleeding? You know, these kind of questions you, you could ask. That's why I said the knowledge you got along the way, you must use that to uh, get your history more robust. You know, look around for explanations on all directions to explain what's going to you know, what what you are going to present later also okay and the hemoglobin 7.2 can you like uh, further elaborate on the peripheral smear finding whether it's normocytic or you know like... ah, yes sir uh, we have done a peripheral smear sir peripheral smear was showing normocytic normochromic anemia sir okay. it's a normocytic normochromic anemia we have uh, Okay, we do you have the MCV like um, uh, no, uh, no, sir. MCV, MCH, and MCHC were within normal limits. Sir. Okay, and uh, um, again, uh, we have a combination of albumin being low and uh, anemia. This, this can ca happen in a number of conditions. And uh, another thing is RFT is normal. I am we are interested in the electrolytes, you know, like serum electrolytes for this. Have you got any results? Serum electrolytes? Uh, sorry, sir, I don't have the details right now. Okay. But it was normal, sir. But I, no, 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 Anvita. Sir. The, the, the bicarbonate was 32. The rest of the electrolytes are normal. What about urine test? When you have an no. albumin like this, immediately. Urine, urine, albumin, nil, urine albumin nil, deposits nil, sugar nil. And the electrolytes, potassium was normal, sodium was 138, uh, bicarbonate was 32 on one occasion. After a few days, it was 24. The rest of the parameters are okay. Potassium, sodium was quite okay. Why is within 48 hours? The bicarbonate is 32 and 24. First one is 32, second was 24. Potassium, sodium, chloride was normal. I vividly remember that. Uh -huh. Okay. It's okay. And urine albumin nil, that you should have mentioned. It's okay. Okay, sir. Incidentally, on this day, on this day when the child was hospitalized, the child had ecchymosis also. Uh, she she did not mention because that this, this ecchymosis appeared only suddenly in one day. It was not there previously. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, with this, like, uh, what, what are the, like, uh, now we, we have the results, you know, yes, sir. investigations with this, what, what is your thinking? What are your thoughts based on the, these results? Uh, so since uh, albumin is low and... Uh, diagnosis, but what are your thoughts combining, you know, like um, these two things? Don't, don't keep on moving the slides, Anvita. Don't keep uh, on, keep the investigation slide static. Yes, static. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice, nice thing. Yeah, just keep it there. I will be more specific. To this uh, coagulation profile, what are the possibilities? Uh, so since PT, APTT, and INR is prolonged, uh, low, uh, low albumin, and uh, so I, I might think of uh, liver, uh, synthetic function of the liver might be affected, sir. Okay, that is one thing. Uh, is there anything that, uh, you know, like uh, uh, that 
that can uh, you know present with a similar picture like um, what is uh, necessary for a synthetic function like especially what pt what is the vitamin k vitamin k no, uh, can you get in molar function as well uh, you know this kind of picture anvita please don't move the slide sorry sir sorry sir there is a slide don't move the slide yeah keep it focused yeah problem with the this is sorry sir yeah yeah therefore uh, with this is unlikely to be a renal cause and uh, you know uh, it, you know cardiac uh, as sir said the child is not very sick therefore we already ruled out and uh, therefore uh, i think uh, with this we can get only in with mal absorption as well as uh, any liver problem do you think there is a significant liver, liver problem apart from the you know coagulation profile world is there anything to point there is a significant liver problem uh, as a systemic examination was liver was palpable 3 cm under right costal margin sir okay but uh, but uh, is there, is there any change in the you know like firmness or anything about the liver consistency you have not mentioned and liver span uh consistency uh, firm firming consistency sir okay therefore still um, we have a open you know like um, we can have open mind with pia yeah? like a liver problem or but it's very unlikely uh, as we discussed earlier without jaundice without elevation of liver enzymes very very unlikely and um, mal absorption again we can get the same kind of picture you know you can have anemia hypoanemia and you know because of vitamin deficiency vitamin k deficiency you can get uh, the co coagulation abnormality and dr sneha your thoughts uh, was there any bleeding i mean if you were to ask the mother more more questions what kind of questions will you ask for bleeding sometimes she may not have right realized to mention that you what else can you ask uh ma'am like a uh, prolonged bleeding after vaccination ma'am from the uh, injection yeah. Uh, site yeah yeah and any uh, bleeding into joints or uh, any delayed uh, 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 hello so uh, any uh, bleeding yeah gi bleeding the stool color you know whether there's any uh, change in the stool color to suggest any intestinal bleeding Uh, or it could be fresh bleeding also when you have you know when you have shown us this investigation ct ptd that's you know extremely surprising we weren't prepared for that result with your uh, like you know history what you presented history and your examination anyway so uh, you know you have to question again at this point you have to go back and question again was there any swelling after vaccination was there any change in the stool color at any point of time sometimes you know they might have gone for this to a doctor and received a transfusion already uh so depending on what they think is uh, you know tell you up front when they come into the casualty they may not remember to do everything so already a transfusion has been given or some medications has been given someone has noticed anemia before so all this you have to ask again and again you have to go back again 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 into the history okay okay, okay. okay. any are there more investigation ah uh, yes ma'am uh i'll we uh, did an ultrasound abdomen mom uh, it was showing mild hepatomegaly with increased echogenicity and uh, peripheral smear was showing normocytic normochromic anemia uh since pt aptt was prolonged and albumin was low and ultrasound was showing increased echogenicity and one of the differential diagnosis was uh, lch uh, we plan to uh, do skin uh, liver or bone marrow biopsy initially mom uh but uh, uh since pt apt was prolonged we uh, gave a vitamin k injection for 3 days ma'am uh, pt apt inr uh, initially which was 120 after one dose of vitamin k pt was almost 19.6 seconds apt t was 43.5 inr was 1.7 and after three doses uh, pt was almost normal 12.1 apt t was 29.3 seconds and inr was 1.9 post albumin transfusion albumin was 3.6 and edema significantly reduced after transfusion uh since uh, pt aptt getting corrected with uh, vitamin k and albumin is uh, holding on with albumin transfusion uh, the synthetic liver function abnormality was less likely at this point of time uh, yes 
agree with that. So then what is left then? Like other thing I wanted to ask is like, uh, who, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, yes, sir. Previous, previous. How oh, answer? How oh, yes, sir? Okay, okay. You know, I was looking at the total counts. It's it's it's, it's not very you know like abnormal. Yeah. Officer. Okay, yeah. Don't keep uh, on moving. Ah, gee, focus I on see. one slide and go ahead. Go ahead, Amita. Yes, sir. Uh, further workup, uh, we are, uh, uh, pediatric dermatologist Dr. Ramkumar's opinion was sought. Uh, he uh, opined it to be acrodermatitis enteropathicus, uh, zinc deficiency, probably secondary to malabsorption. Hence, uh, vitamin D and zinc levels were sent. Uh, vitamin D was 55 nanograms per ml, which was on the higher limit of the normal, and serum zinc levels were low. Uh, on zinc supplementation, the skin was drastically reduced. Uh, in view of hypoalbuminemia, we also uh, uh, went up with secondary immunodeficiency uh, workup, uh, where immunoglobin profile was done, which was normal, and uh, flow cytometry was done, uh, which was showing normal T, B, and NK cells. So coagulopathy getting corrected with vitamin K and anisarca reducing with albumin transfusion with peripensmia showing normocytic normochromic anemia. Uh, where, uh, uh, when we went into the uh, differential diagnosis, since uh, there was erythematous skin rash, hepatomegaly, uh, sorry, uh, there is some... Erythematous skin rash, hepatomegaly, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and hypoalbuminemia, and coagulopathy. Uh, Langerhans cell histocytosis was a probability. So we went ahead with a skin biopsy, which showed non-specific changes. There were not any. There were no features suggestive of uh, Langerhans cell histocytosis. Rita, uh, uh, if I interrupt you here, so in the discussion you said liver is unlikely, but yet we have, uh, you know, low albumin, vitamin K deficiency features, etc. Right? That yes, you decided in your thought process, you decided. So at that point, um, why wouldn't you just think of looking at that stool rather than going for more invasive in infections? Because there is, you know, liver is there. Liver is functioning, looks like it's functioning all right, but these things are not, albumin is not, was not picking up or PTPTT was extremely prolonged. So there was a problem with vitamin K there. So the next thought would be, you know, what's happening? Is there an absorption, isn't it? So then the next thing will be to look at the stool, yeah, you right. know, examine the stool, look at the stool, you know, what are the losses in the stool? So wouldn't that be the next, uh, you know, appropriate action? Because you have already, uh, Dr. Anvita, you already mentioned that the child has, uh, you know, like a rash and which responded to zinc, you know, it points to a small absorption, you know, or if you have wavered, like, uh, you know, like uh, doing the skin biopsy, probably uh, the response was later, you know, after doing the skin biopsy or, you know, what was the reason why we proceeded with the skin biopsy? Because you said, already said there was a good response to zinc. Uh, so actually, uh, this uh, zinc supplementation was actually uh, three to four days after admission. So initially, we were thinking of metabolic liver disease. Uh, then we went ahead uh, and LCH. So uh, first, we went up with the skin biopsy reports, uh, skin biopsy here. Later, uh, we asked the dermatologist's opinion, and uh, he suggested it might be due to zinc deficiency. And later on, we went with the zinc supplementation. Uh -huh. Once you make a diagnosis of malabsorption, what is the commonest cause of malabsorption in, the, in, in this particular age group? Uh, in congenital intestinal uh, malformation, sir. Commonest cause of malabsorption in this age group is pancreatic malabsorption. Uh, okay. Yes, I think, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can proceed for it. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Often, Sneha, you want to ask anything else? Dr. Sneha? No, uh, I'm fine. Carry okay. on, Sanjita. Uh, 
the stools were completely normal. It was a yellow breastfed baby stool. It was not oily. It was not watery. There was no diarrhea. Absolutely normal stools on exam, naked eye examination. Okay. Since with what if metabolic liver disease is entered with the off-tall workup, which was normal, and the child never had hypoglycemia, and there was no history of poor feeding or vomiting, and hair microscopy was normal. And the uh, the last transitional diagnosis because of the skin rash, anasarca, and hypoalbuminemia and prolonged PTAPDT. Since metabolic liver disease is unlikely, we thought of protein losing enteropathy. In the main course, uh, during the hospital stay subsequently, her cough person and she had tachypnea and distress requiring oxygen. At this point of time, we were uh, actually in a doubt whether yeah, this... Dr. Anvita, like uh, you said protein losing enteropathy, you know, you said uh, stools are not watery, there is no diarrhea, then why are you thinking about protein losing enteropathy? Usually they are present with diarrhea, you know, like... Uh, is it, but there was no history of diarrhea in this patient, sir. Okay. Uh, during, yes, sir. Uh, during the course, uh, she had tachypnea and distress requiring oxygen. Uh, at this point of time, we had a doubt whether it was an uh, hospital acquired viral in, uh, illness or it was a worsening primary lung disease. Uh, so, uh, since the uh, uh, do you have a chest x-ray? I, I don't know if, did I miss the chest x-ray? I don't know because I was out of, I got signed out in between. Uh, do we have a chest x-ray to see? I in the right at the beginning, along with your investigation. I don't have a chest x-ray, but the finding uh, I have one. All right. Essentially normal except for minimal bilateral hyperinflation. There is absolutely no uh, consolidation or increased interstitial markings. X-ray was absolutely benign. In fact, the mother had some cough and coriza and fever. We thought this child is also pick, picked up a viral infection. That's what we thought at that point in time. X-ray oh. was benign, absolutely benign. It didn't show anything. But I'm not sharing all those because uh, you know parents are very sensitive about it. I took permission even to discuss this case with them. Uh, since there was a, a worsening cough with increasing distress, uh, we thought of a hospital required infection. Uh, because uh, RSV bronchiolitis cases are common, uh, we sent first uh, nasopharyngeal aspirate for RSV, which was negative, and we repeated a CRP, which was negative. Uh, initial chest x ray was normal, uh, but repeat chest x ray also did not show any infiltrates. In view of increasing distress, uh, she was put under PICU care. In PICU, uh, her, her distress was sent requiring HFNC and the respiratory biofire was sent, which, uh, which uh, showed para-influenza virus. Uh, and in uh, view of persisting cough, uh, cough swab was sent, which showed heavy growth of Klebsiella pneumonia and pseudomonas. Subsequently, her distress was sent and a repeat chest x-ray uh, was done, which showed right middle lobe collapse. Uh, at this point of time, we started on just physiotherapy and positioning. Uh, initially, we thought of protein losing enteropathy and metabolic liver disease, but uh, during the course, uh, as her cough was and requiring uh, HFNC and cough swab showing heavy growth of Klebsiella and uh, pseudomonas, uh, cystic fibrosis would be a possibility at this point of time. We thought of cystic fibrosis. And uh, when we went back into the history, uh, there was raised uh, IRT levels in the newborn screening, and we have sent for uh, fecal elastase, which was low. And since there was raised IRT levels in the newborn screening, low fecal elastase, though non-specific, persistent cough with distress, and hypoalbuminemia. Though initial RFT was normal, repeat RFT was showing uh, hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis, and cough swab showing heavy growth of Klebsiella pneumonia and pseudomonas aeruginosa. A uh, probability of cystic fibrosis was considered, uh, but uh, against the cystic fibrosis was that um, this was a non consanguineous marriage and there was never history of hot smelling bulky stools. There was no failure to thrive and there was no cholesterol hepatitis. Uh, 
uh, hello uh, Sneha and Anthony to comment at this point of time before we talk about further things Dr. Sneha yeah, so um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say now, but uh, uh, Anvita, if I may say frankly, you know, from the beginning, I see a hesitation in you to say the word cystic fibrosis. Okay, that's just not you or any of us. It is a systematic, uh, like, you know, elimination from our, uh, you know, workup over generations that cystic fibrosis is an uncommon disease. Don't talk about it. Okay, so it, that is why it comes in at the end. So that is not the case. If, you know, now I am I mean, really like after my postgraduates and whoever I meet to insist I and mean, to tell them that cystic fibrosis is common in our country. Once we make that change in our attitude, Cystic fibrosis become one of the diagnoses in very young infants presenting with anything under the sun. In the sense, like for TB, we have been trained, all pediatricians have been trained to think of TB, whatever the presentation is. Similarly, young babies with any problem keep CF as a differential diagnosis. This uh, anemia, hypoalbuminemia, edema is a very classical presentation. You would you know that now from because you would have read up already. And all of us have gone through this process of, uh, you know, thinking of it a bit late, all of us, every single one of us, because only because, you know, for generations we have been told that it's not a common disease. It is a very common disease. I mean, I'm, when I say common, it's not like as common as dengue. It is a significant differential diagnosis to be considered in Tamil Nadu. So that will make it you know, the rest of the discussion. I'm just putting that there for the rest of the discussion. Okay. Yeah, for me also, like, uh, you know, even without respiratory symptoms, any child presenting with, you know, hyperalbuminemia, anemia, I think about malabsorption. If it is malabsorption, pancreatic malabsorption. If it is pancreatic malabsorption, it's cystic fibrosis. Therefore, uh, that's how it works because we have had number of patients diagnosed even before they develop respiratory symptoms. Um, okay, therefore, like, uh, yeah. Therefore, cystic fibrosis can up, come up now in your differential diagnosis, Dr. You Pratt. can boldly discuss cystic fibrosis also. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and other thing is metabolic alkalosis. That's very, very, you know, if you see a child, you know, you know the albumin, albumin, albumin is low, like, uh, uh, usually the vascular compartment, you know, uh, will be, uh, you know, um, on the lower side. Therefore, we expect uh, some kind of metabolic acidosis and uh, any child having metabolic alkalosis, again, uh, that should be high in your differential diagnosis with uh, albumin being low. Yeah. I saw. Uh, this, is, this is just an algorithmic approach uh, for the suspected cystic fibrosis case. Uh, indications for evaluation is clinical if clinical symptoms suggest of cystic fibrosis or a positive newborn screen like raised IRT levels or a sibling with cystic fibrosis, we'll go ahead with the sweat chloride testing. Uh, in infants, we can wait until more than two weeks and more than two kgs is asymptomatic. Uh, if sweat chloride test is abnormal, that is more than 60 millimoles per liter or uh, it's between 30 to 59, we'll take it as intermediate. We'll go ahead with the CFTR gene, CFTR gene sequencing and if it's less than 29 millimoles per liter, we'll take it as normal. And uh, in abnormal and intermediate sweat chloride testing, we'll go ahead with the CFTR gene sequencing. Uh, there should be uh, two cystic fibrosis uh, variants uh, should be identified. The slides are jumping because of your nervousness or naturally jumping? I think that is, uh, uh, be nervous, Anita. Be natural. Yeah. Something is wrong with the screen, I think. Yeah, right. I think Dr. Manoj. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, is this your first patient to where you have diagnosis of fibrosis, Dr. Manoj? No, sir. No, sir. Yeah, you've seen quite a few, sir. Quite a few. And uh, 
can you like uh, try to enumerate what are the different presentations of cystic fibrosis you have seen and uh, how they can present from uh, from fetal neonatal infant older kids uh, sir uh, neonatal uh, the common presentations include a uh, cholestatic glandulus or meconium ileus sir fetal any any other indications any any like uh, uh, any markers of cystic fibrosis in the intrauterine period like uh, Intrauterine. I'm not sure. Sir, newborn screening. We look at the IRT, sir. Yeah, therefore, the one thing they they usually come. Echo name. Echo echogenic bubbles, you know, echogenic bubbles. Those kind of babies, you have to be very, you know, okay, uh, of cystic fibrosis when they are born. You have to look for their, you know, whether they pass meconium. Yes, uh, meconium ileus is a uh, common presenting feature in the newborn, sir. Yeah, meconium ileus. Uh, you have seen babies with meconium ileus? Like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All those babies are tested for cystic fibrosis as well? Uh, yes, sir. I've seen one case of proven cystic fibrosis presenting as well. Don't move the slides. Don't move the slides, and Anita. Just keep it. Keep that cystic fibrosis algorithm. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, please don't move. Don't, don't touch the screen at all. Just yeah. keep it. Yeah, the next slide. Yeah, just keep it there. Okay. Now, before we move ahead with the discussion, I think I would uh, direct it to uh, Dr. Uh, Sneha and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Anthony, few questions to you. One, what is the specificity and sensitivity of immunoreactive trypsinogen, number one? Number two, uh, how often you perform sweat chloride test in a baby who's four months old? Number two. Number three, how often you find the cystic fibrosis uh, presenting like this so early in four months in your experience? What percentage of cases you have seen present primarily with uh, this sort of hypoproteinemia, exclusively breastfed infant without diarrhea surprising you? And how many cases of cystic fibrosis you have seen primarily presenting with skin lesions? These are my directed questions to two of the experts. I'm sure both of you would have seen large number of cases in India and abroad. I would request you to take up one by one these questions so that we move forward. Dr. Sneha. Anthony, you can go ahead. I think uh, uh, you can go ahead. You have more experience than me, Dr. Okay. So but, but you might have to remind me the questions again, but maybe I'll take the IRT, immunoreactive trypsinogen. So if you see the algorithms which are used for uh, in newborn screening, it is not just one IRT because it, it may be sensitive, but it won't be that specific to, it, it is a, not a diagnostic test. It is a screening test. So uh, the countries which use IRT, immunoreactive trypsinogen, as a, uh, as a test, they usually do it two times, IRT and IRT. Or they use IRT with the genetic screening. So that is how they put that in the protocol for uh, diagnosing. So there are various ways. We won't go into the different uh, ways of using this. It is an algorithm, just like the algorithm you're showing on the screen here. Newborn screening is an algorithm. So if you get a high... Uh, IRT level. So the, the high in that system, it can be either a fixed value or it can be a floating value. In some places, they say the, the low, highest five percentile of that day's value is taken as abnormal. So it, it, sometimes in some uh, protocols, they say a cutoff value, 64 or 49 or something, they will take as a cutoff value. So anything above that will be checked again and checked again, meaning uh, another IRT or there is another test called PAP, pancreatitis associated protein, that also goes high in a CF patient. So using one or two is when it comes positive, it's called a screen positive. Then you take that patient for a sweat test and that is the diagnostic test. Before that, you cannot say it is cystic fibrosis. It is a screen only. Okay, so uh, in, in a small baby, four month old baby, you really pointed out very correctly, Dr. Balasubramaniam, it is very difficult to collect the sweat. It is not easy. So in this kind of a situation, our treatment is going to be empirical. We have to start treatment empirically because we will lose valuable time if we wait for a diagnosis. If we suspect with any of those features you have already discussed, we start empirically and then wait for the diagnosis to be done. 
so that would be the uh, protocol and you you were asking also like you know how many we have seen uh, nowadays uh, let's say in the last two years the, ba the it is the babies we are uh, diagnosing i used to be diagnosing children before but now uh, i really don't want to diagnose children because we want to pick them up before they really become sick so we are looking out for them and we are diagnosing more and more we have numerous patients with this kind of presentation and really we must pick up before this presentation happens so at the first point when they're beginning to the failing to thrive itself we have to start catching them you know that is where we have to catch before they develop the hypoalbuminemia or the anemia or anything so i would say if you order blood transfusion for a baby less than 6 months you stop there and ask the question why is there cystic fibrosis not cystic fibrosis as the cause but keep it in your differential don't be hesitant to consider cystic fibrosis if you write blood transfusion order unless there is baby has been bleeding or you know some kind of a disaster something has happened not in neonates beyond the age of one month if you are if you are investigating for you know diarrhea pneumonia you know that uh, you you must consider cystic fibrosis also if you are in if you are seeing hypoalbuminemia along with anemia you know if you just look at your computer screen or your test reports the patients bring anemia is there along with that albumin is low stop there consider cf also don't hesitate like, you know, oh, this is such a rare disease. Don't have that attitude in Tamil Nadu. Keep that CF is as possible as any other disease. Because this, this age group, one month to six months, there are very few things which can go wrong when they are well-fed, I mean, well, directly breastfed and the, they are under the care of the mother. There are very few things which can go wrong. And CF is definitely one of them. So if you don't move the that, slides at the time, don't move, don't distract, uh, don't, say, don't move uh, the slides. Don't uh, uh, close it, always close it. It's it distracting. Madam is talking. Me. Yeah, so please go ahead, Dr. Sneha. Sorry. Okay. So uh, now I don't, uh, I don't remember. Was there one more question, sir? Uh, did I answer all? No, did the, you have more next, questions? No, what is the youngest you have seen? That yeah. is number one. What okay. percentage, what percentage of the patients you have diagnosed in your center have presented with uh, uh, a protein losing entropy or a malabsorption uh, without primary uh, serious uh, respiratory manifestation, without neonatal meconemilias, et cetera. That's what I wanted to know, uh, yeah. how common it is in yeah. your experience. Yes. Yeah, so, so the thing is, by the time they come to the hospital at the third month or two and a half to three months to four months, that, that is the respiratory is what brings the patient. To the hospital so we will see only after the first bronchiolitis or some respiratory we are really looking out to catch them before that but unfortunately we are not able to because what brings them to the hospital is the respiratory and and they have all these features so very very rarely we have caught them before that though we are looking out for that so you know you have to do newborn screening for that or you have to catch them when they are failing to thrive in your immunization clinic and think of CF as a differential. But you know, there are so many differentials for a failing to thrive baby at six weeks or 10 weeks. There are some more, are not just, but keep this also in mind. So truly, I must admit, you know, uh, uh, maybe just one or two patients before the first respiratory symptoms started, I got, I caught them at that point. It is two, two months or two and a half months. And our, our average wage was 1.5 months, sorry, 2.5 months in our group of infants of 20 cases which we published recently, we have about um, 30 or 35 less than you know, young infants we have diagnosed. The average age is about two and a half to three and a half months. But still, the respiratory symptom had actually started. That is what will bring them to the hospital. Uh, we have had babies coming with um, this kind of just malnutrition, anasarka, kwashioka type of features. Um, they would have had the respiratory symptoms somewhere else and they would have diagnosed and then come to us. So maybe at that point there was not respiratory, but respiratory had already happened to them in another hospital maybe. So this is, this is a common presentation in cystic fibrosis. Yeah. And Anthony, what about your experience, Anthony? Sir, like uh, as you said, uh, the IRT... Uh, uh, the sensitivity is quite good, sir, but you have to be aware that in children with myeles, IRT can be falsely normal. And therefore, in myeles, you can't go by IRT. Therefore, you have to do other investigations as well. Space, regarding the specificity, it's not very specific test. Therefore, we do a repeat IRT, and if it is elevated, then 
uh, go for further testing. And regarding, uh, you know, the presentations we have had, we had a similar... Just one minute, one minute, Dr. Anthony. How useful is IRT beyond the newborn period? Sir, uh, actually, we are not doing IRT. These are patients referred to us by neonatologists who do IRT and regularly. We don't do IRT as such. It's not useful so beyond... What about Sneha? Do you do IRT beyond neonatal period? Neonatal no. period? No. Beyond neonatal, it is a, as a screening test for all newborns. That is the role of IRT. It is not a diagnostic test. It is not to be used beyond three weeks of age. Even less than, see, when, when at three weeks, if you're suspecting, you must do the diagnostic test, not the IRT test. But, you know, if the first IRT was done and you want to counter check it, you can go up to three weeks to repeat it. But beyond that, that's not useful because we don't know the cutoff values. And many external influences can, may affect the IRT. So that is not validated to use beyond that age. Yeah. And other thing, is, yeah, other thing is the fecal elastase, sir. Fecal elastase, we find it very useful for making a provisional diagnosis. Because even if you don't have a sweat test, in centers where they don't have any tests for cystic purpose, you can even send a stool for testing to another center. It's uh, done as ELISA method. It's not very, it's 3,500. But, um, you know, it's a 90% uh, of cystic fibrosis patients have pancreatic insufficiency. And, uh, you know, a normal pancreatic elastase doesn't rule out you know, cystic fibrosis, but most of the times we find this pancreatic elastase being low. But uh, you have to be very careful when you do a, you know, pancreatic elastase on uh, the loose stool, you get a false low value. Therefore, whenever you send for pancreatic elastase, the stool has to be formed. Therefore, you have to make sure child doesn't have diarrhea. Therefore, if a child has a typical phenotype of pancreatic elastase is low, we usually start empirical therapy for cystic fibrosis. That's another, you know, test that's quite useful for places where they don't have sweat testing. And regarding, yeah, and regarding uh, young babies, apart from pancreatic elastase, sometimes we are not able to do sweat tests and for small babies weighing less than five kgs, sometimes it becomes you know, difficult to get the sweat. In those kind of babies, like uh, usually do a pancreatic elastase and uh, I think uh, Sneha is uh, doing a, a program, uh, you know, a study, uh, therefore they are doing the genetic testing for free. Therefore, we do a pancreatic elastase, and if we think we are not able to get a sweat, we then directly send for genetic testing. Again, it's better to do a, a complete mutation analysis rather than doing panels because we don't know exactly when you send for genetic testing, don't set, send for panels. If they are doing few you know, mutations, the chance of missing cystic fibrosis is very high because we don't know exactly what kind of mutation we have in our uh, Indian patients. Therefore, whenever you send for genetic testing, we have to send for complete uh, mutation analysis, not for panels. That's another thing. Uh, because uh, when, when we get uh, the mutation panel thing, if it is negative, then probably we should not tell that the child doesn't have cystic fibrosis. And regarding the presentations, as you said, we have quite a, a few presentations in infants, like uh, with metonymialias, and then protracted bronchiolitis, just like what your patient had, like protracted bronchiolitis. Usually bronchiolitis has a natural course, you know, usually settles down the second week, but children who have small airway disease, which is not improving, uh, you know, after two weeks, definitely we have to consider uh, cystic fibrosis. And other thing, I think uh, Sneha will agree with me, uh, you know, babies who are becoming lethargic during summer season and presenting with, you know, um, salt losing crisis, they present with, you know, uh, dehydration and metabolic alkalosis instead of acidosis. Therefore, any child during summer season, dehydrated, we expect metabolic acidosis. If they present with metabolic alkalosis, again, you know, it's a, it's a red flag sign. That's another thing. And I had uh, one patient who presented similar to your patient, sir, with acrodermatitis antropathica. The patient was, uh, you know, coughing a lot, actually, the provisional diagnosis uh, by the referring pediatrician was pertussis because the cough is like that. I have a video of that as well. Therefore, uh, uh, with anasarca, pertussis is like cough with anasarca and acrodermatitis enteropathica. This is, and we, we had a couple of patients who didn't have cough. Before that, they had molar absorption presented like this. Therefore, it's not necessary. These children should have cough. Therefore, molar absorption, uh, pancreatic molar absorption, cystic fibrosis, unless put otherwise. And older kids, as we see, uh, they can present with the typical wet cough, separative lung disease, clubbing, you know, that kind of presentation. But 
I think most of these uh, children can be picked up unless they are, you know, atypical. They can be picked up in the first year, and um, earlier the better. Yeah, very well said, uh, both of you. I must compliment both of you for sharing your rich personal experience. Because as a general pediatrician, I would share uh, uh, what I have seen. Uh, one. Uh, the garden variety cystic fibrosis presentation is that of a child who has a recurrent V's or recurrent LRI. And the moment you see the child, you see clubbing and you find the child is failing to thrive. That's the most common thing I have seen. That's number one. Number two, the next common presentation as Dr. Anthony put it very rightly, is that of a child who gets admitted with an LRI in whom we are not able to wean off oxygen and we do some virus tests and we draw blank and we don't know what to do. And at that point of time, we start looking at the growth centiles carefully. We start thinking of a mucociliary disease and then we go and get the diagnosis. That's number two. Number three is some intestinal problem, some intestinal problem. It may be obstruction in the newborn period or even later on, or it may be, in fact, I have seen a child who had intractable constipation, who had clubbing, ultimately, I thought this is going to be something like celiac or something like that, ultimately it turned out to be cystic fibrosis. Fourth, it's a barter-like presentation. I think that is where we general pediatricians should be careful. Child comes with failure to thrive, polyuria, everything looks like barter. Then you start looking at the nails, there is some clubbing. And uh, in fact, I had one child who had a barter-like presentation. The moment the child went out of the intermediate care ward in the ICW into a non-AC room during April, the next day, the child became dehydrated. We put him back into the AC ward. Everything returns normal. Ultimately, it turned out to be cystic fibrosis. Mind you, the child never had a cough any time in the life. It turned out to be cystic fibrosis. Uh, the last presentation is something related to malabsorption. And like this, in fact, uh, even in my wild dreams, a breastfed baby weighing 5 kg, not having diarrhea, not having oily stool, only skin manifestations, I would never have dreamt of this being cystic fibrosis. And in fact, we were looking at all the time LCH, LCH, we were obsessed with LCH. At this, in this case, we actually had a dilemma what to do. In fact, we had a team discussion with the gastroenterologist. And in fact, I almost sat on his neck and told him, you have to do a endoscopy to, in fact, our primary diagnosis at that time was some congenital abnormality because at that point of time, respiratory manifestations were not severe. And we knew this is not liver disease. We thought this could be lymphangiectasia or an anomaly. And in fact, uh, the gastroenterologist also felt that this child could have a problem in the gut as well as in the liver. He wanted to do a liver biopsy and an endoscopy. Thank God we decided against it. We only decided to wait and send the exam sequencing based on the immunoreactive trypsinogen. And we had to painfully wait for about two weeks Ultimately, the gene sequencing is classical of uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. We didn't even do sweat chloride test, but we thought the interpretation is going to be dicey in a young infant. We didn't proceed further. Ultimately, a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis was confirmed in this child, much to the agony of the uh, parents. And uh, what take-home message I would give from this is as rightly pointed out by Dr. Sneha, cystic fibrosis like Kawasaki is very much there in India, including me. General pediatricians like me, I'm sure, must be missing quite a few cases and making a delayed diagnosis. We should be on the lookout for the possibility of cystic fibrosis. We should think of 
rare presentations. In fact, uh, Dr. Srinivas, my colleague, gastroenterologist, actually we had a we had an alert, adolescent girl who 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 was diagnosed as cystic fibrosis. The sibling had an autistic behavior, and the child had intestinal obstruction. Ultimately, it turned out to be cystic fibrosis in that child also. The child never had respiratory manifestation. I think the possibility has to be thought of. It's not a disease of Europe and Asia. Thanks to experts like uh, uh, Sneha and Anthony Terence working on such diseases, the prognosis should hopefully improve. improve. Over to Dr. Sneha and uh, Dr. Anthony Terence. It's already 9.01. Dr. Rajendran has sent a message. It's time up. I look forward to your final comments from your experience, both of you. Just one Dr. point, Anvita, uh, you had Hi, mentioned, yes, you know, consanguinity was not there. Oh, right? yes, so as a point against CF. So I, I've actually stopped asking for that history altogether in CF because uh, you don't need to get consanguinity at all because why it is, it's a very endogamous uh, marriages. That means, the marriages are within the community. So in Tamil Nadu, Tamil speaking, a certain community will marry only within the Tamil speaking, that community, isn't it? Mostly, any, any community you take. So over generations, this has been going on. So wherever the mutations are there, it is getting concentrated generation after generation. So, I mean, everybody is consanguineous by default, just that we don't know the, how we are related. We are all consanguineous by over generations now. So, you know, in our, uh, our list also, there are very few consanguinity. Many, many are non consanguineous and they have homozygous or heterozygous mutation, even homozygous mutation. So, that won't be surprising. So, just wanted to uh, tell you about that. Okay. And uh, in fact, this, in this child, the parents are not only non consanguineous, they also had a love marriage, actually. They are uh, Tamilians. Uh, absolutely not related anywhere. Uh, that's a very good point you had mentioned. I think presence of consanguinity, neither does it confirm cystic fibrosis or does it exclude cystic, absence does, uh, 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 excludes cystic fibrosis. That's a very good uh, uh, take home point. Uh, I, I think we should start thinking of the possibility of diagnosis. Dr. Anthony, you have any more comments? Yeah, sir. Another uh, thing I, which I missed out is the first patient which I diagnosed cystic fibrosis was inter interesting coincidence that uh, it's an infant who presented with uh, acute severe wheeze, actually. The child was presented with respiratory failure. We have to intubate the baby on arrival. And, um, and uh, you know, like, because the child was not uh, responding to asthma therapy, like, uh, and there was lots of secretions. And uh, we sent the you know, a sputum for culture, the tracheal aspirate for culture turned up to be pseudomonas. Therefore, based on pseudomonas, we made the diagnosis. Therefore, any patient, it's very unusual to get pseudomonas from the lungs. Therefore, if you get a pseudomonas, you know, you have to think about cystic fibrosis. And as you said, like, uh, once you start uh, thinking about uh, a condition, you know, like in the differential diagnosis, when you, and even the history itself, we came uh, to the cystic fibrosis and the in investigation. I think you have, when we you know, when suspect a condition, like uh, in a, even in the history, then I think you may diagnose the condition more, actually. Therefore, in, for our patients, 80% of them had the combination, the triad of, you know, um, respiratory symptoms, malabsorption, and failure to thrive. Therefore, when you have a combination, I think uh, cystic fibrosis, unless put otherwise, respiratory protracted or recurrent respiratory symptoms, failure to thrive in combination, you know, when you explore only get the malabsorption part. Usually it's the, it's the uh, recurrent or protracted respiratory symptoms with failure to thrive. And then uh, when you explore, you get the malabsorption part and then you examine the stool, you get artistry. Therefore, the triad, and when you have the triad, you have to think about cystic fibrosis. Yeah, Final, finally, I have uh, two questions before we wind up. Now that these two experts are there, one question is, uh, how often both of you do the cough swab in these uh, infants? What is the specificity, sensitivity? How do you interpret? That's question number one. Both of you can answer. Question number two, how would you manage this type? 
from now on. Now, now it's five months old. We have confirmed cystic fibrosis. What would be the steps for the sake of postgraduates? Uh, both of you can elaborate on these two questions. Dr. Sneha and Dr. Anthony. Yes, uh, we will do either a cough swab or a deep throat swab. When it's a very small baby, you can just do uh, some saline nebulization, tap the chest like chest physiotherapy, and you can do a deep throat swab. Presence of pseudomonas, we already discussed. It, unless the baby is immunodeficient, a community acquired setting pseudomonas, finding pseudomonas is very, very suggestive of CF. So that's one of the things, you know, when you, when you start working up this patient, one thing, either the anemia or the hypoalbuminemia, or something which kind of makes you think of CF as a differential diagnosis, do of these things. Do a cough swab because it takes two days for, not cough swab, throat swab. It will take two days for the result to come. Send the stool for a last taste because that will take another one week to come. So that by the time you have done the other evaluation in your liver, kidney, et cetera, you have the result in support to, for you to start the empiric treatment, though, though you don't have the diagnostic test result. Um, so that is what I would do. Um, and uh, uh, maybe Dr. Anthony can tell about the steps of treatment. I think, uh, yes, yeah, I think, um, yeah, as uh, Dr. Snega said, like uh, the main thing is uh, the critical step is making the diagnosis. As we make the diagnosis earlier, the prognosis is going to be better. And treatment is going to be multidisciplinary. And uh, we should not think. The cystic fibrosis is a lung disease. We should think cystic fibrosis is a systemic disease and a genetic disease. Therefore, um, it's equally important to concentrate on the lungs as well as the intestines. Therefore, uh, growth monitoring, uh, creon, vitamin A, D, E, K supplementation is as uh, you know is as important as treating the lungs. Sometimes, what happens is to begin with that. Uh, myself, you know, like uh, I was concentrating more on the lungs, you know, like and um, concentrate less on the uh, intestinal part. Therefore, uh, the prognosis, the outcomes were not very good unless you start concentrating on the nutrition part of it. It's equally very important. Therefore, what we do with for the lungs is like airway clearance therapy. Uh, you, we have like, you, you know, uh, mucus thinning agents like uh, hypertonic saline and then uh, chest physiotherapy. There are different types. You can do cupping, you can do PEP devices, acapella. And you, uh, it's important to get help of a physiotherapist. Lots of things you can't do by yourself. Therefore, it's multidisciplinary. Therefore, you need a physiotherapist to help with the physiotherapy. And uh, it's important to get parents involved. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Whatever you are prescribing is not going to work. Whatever they, are, whatever they are going to do at home is going to work. Therefore, it's important to empower and train the parents and uh, ask them to follow whatever you, know, uh, you prescribe. And uh, as I said, nutrition is very important. Another thing is like uh, psychosocial aspects because uh, you have to plan the therapy based on the income of the parents. Therefore, it's very important to support them emotionally as well because if it is a chronic disease, lots of patients lose hope. And uh, you have to support them emotionally and um, you have to plan treatment according to their economic situation. And last but not the least, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a genetic disease. Therefore, it's not only the disease of the child, it's a disease of the family. Therefore, you don't want another child with cystic fibrosis in the family. Therefore, you have to give proper counseling and genetic counseling for the family so that we don't have another baby with cystic fibrosis. It's going to be a big burden. We are not going into the details. This is the broad outline with which I actually follow. And uh, I've got lots of you know, tips from Sneha as well. She can elaborate on a few yeah, things. Very well, very well said, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Turns. Very, very well said. Uh, I know it's very important to sit with the family and discuss all the issues and then counsel them effectively. Uh, are there any questions for the postgraduates? Finally, to the experts before we start winding up the session. It's already 9, 10. 10 minutes we have exceeded. Doesn't matter. Manoj? Yeah, he has asked some question. Role of IOCA factor, Lumica factor, or other genetic therapies? Gene Dr. modifications. Yeah, Dr. Sneha, I'm sure you'll be, you'll be involved in some international work on this? Unfortunately, no, because these are expensive drugs. Um, so this, these are CFTR modulators. So they work on the protein. 
either they help to make the protein or the protein which is not functioning well it helps to make it function well so it really not going into the gene level so this is not at the gene level but at the level of a protein so these drugs ivacaptor and uh, now what is called tricaptor which is a combination of three drugs um, it's it's very Uh, powerful and very effective highly effective treatment that is like you know highly effective uh, art uh, this is called high highly effective modulator therapy hemt hemt it is called now so extremely useful i am hoping that uh, by the time i retire at least i will get to you know prescribe these drugs for my patient because these are extremely expensive this is lifelong treatment you know it's not like one day one dose so unless you have a commitment to continue the treatment we can't just experiment with giving a few doses to a patient so yeah i'm sure you must be giving acetromycin uh, for these all these patients on a prophylactic basis what dose and what regimen you follow dr sneha and dr anthony so acetromycin is for pseudomonas when they are colonized with pseudomonas you can use acetromycin so less than 40 kilos we use 250 mg and above that you can use 500 mg 3 days a week so usually we say for 6 months and reassess because long term azithromycin other problems like atypical mycobacteria this is described in the caucasian population i haven't found much atypical mycobacteria problem here but they who make the guidelines are very careful about pointing out atypical mycobacteria can be a problem so i mean we do use long term not 6 months much longer i use in those who are colonized with pseudomonas incidentally dr cabra uses it daily 5 mg per kg that's a protocol uh, dr cabra is following in all india institute and you know, some centers use 5 mg per kg alternate days dr elarsi has mentioned that the role of immunomodulation yes azithromycin is is a ganga pani which act at all levels it definitely has got an anti inflammatory effect even doxycycline has got an anti inflammatory effect and it does so many things at the mucus level and at the uh, uh, immunomodulator level uh, it has been found to be pretty safe in most cases I mean, some centers use alternate days some centers use three times a week or some centers use daily uh, that's it so do you what about the diet how do you manage the diet of these children dr sneha and dr anthony so uh, diet we try to advise a uh, diet which is the parents can afford by just you know the same principles we use in pediatrics for protein and energy malnutrition increase the fat because they need a high content of fat just because they have fat malabsorption we shouldn't avoid fat it is difficult to convince them to use high fat food oil milk etc because they believe it will cause lung problem but we have to convince them uh, to give high fat high protein diet along with the multivitamin uh, adek supplementation and salt supplementation and with the increasing fat you have to give adequate pancreatic enzymes to cover that so otherwise they will have steatorrhea so increase fat increase uh, you know the pancreatic enzyme to keep the bmi at the 50th centile this is our goal so how far we reach it it's difficult because sometimes we just go touch and then we come down because sometimes parents are not able to maintain the pancreatic enzyme diet is not the issue because you know we know ways to increase calorie all of us pediatricians we are very good in that, that you know add oil and add certain things which can increase the fat content and the calorie content so that's the same principle but um, you know another thing i just want to point out is when you read in the book you will come across a term called fibrosing colonopathy which is uh, said as a complication of increased um, uh, dose of pancreatic enzyme supplement so don't get scared by that word that condition was seen in the 1990s and since then it has not been seen once we figured out once the world figured out how much is the correct dose to use pancreatic enzyme which is much much more than any of us use in our patients because of the cost we are giving very minuscule amounts so with that safe doses this is not going to happen so don't worry about that and cut down the en- enzymes give enzymes liberally making sure stool is non fatty non foul smelling and child is gaining weight that is your titration for the amount of enzyme okay just one final comment to what anthony terrence said earlier uh, actually dr anthony you will be surprised uh, that in protein losing entropy a child may not have over diarrhea this is this is something which is described in literature 
this is something which uh, i have personally seen myself including this baby we have seen at least i have seen at least five or six cases uh, 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 where uh, there had been absolutely no diarrhea but there had been protein losing entropy i think pg here should realize the dr anita please stop sharing the slide uh, pg here should realize that there need not be over diarrhea in protein losing entropy okay dr anita please stop sharing the screen anita please yes, sir. please stop sharing this. yeah no your screen yeah yeah so it's not necessary for somebody with protein losing entropy to have diarrhea that's i think one strong message one two you should not stop thinking of cystic fibrosis just because there are no respiratory manifestations <laughs> i think these are the two important strong take home messages with this i would the hand over to our uh, our ever energetic uh, secretary of iap dr rajendran thank you dr rajendran it's yeah. to you. it's over to you thank you thank you dr sneha and dr anthony it is not only the post graduates who learnt a lot it is somebody like me a senior post graduate who wants to be a lifelong post graduate who has learned thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much sir i think it's a excellent uh, case presentation under uh, leadership of uh, dr sp sir yes we still collectal and um, i thank uh, dr anthony as plus nega and now i request our uh, judges to come in uh, dr sinivasan sir amla vida mantingle so any what is that when uh, uh, experts when experts are there and they have uh, seen so many cases and uh, of course they are all reference and the of course case is very interesting and how it presented so we have to always keep in mind and of course in uh, jipper also now we are seeing lot of cases coming up because of awareness of course dr elc has mentioned about aqua aqua gene testing of course this cyber four months i don't know whether it's that been resting uh, but any anyway, it was a uh, very good uh, in insect case i learned a lot and uh, of course i know dr bala has been having so many cases uh, for a few years because he has been telling us so awareness is very important thank you so much thank you sir now dr elila yeah, sir dr elila uh, good evening sir a uh, very very wonderful and this is obviously expected from a team like sbs sir sneha madam and dr anthony because the only clue that it can be a cystic fibrosis we should derive from C sneha madam and anthony sir there possibly because initially started off as a skin rash and then proceeding and something steroid given so i was wondering and of course only when we came halfway through to the respiratory we picked up but just if uh, you allow me to say anything i think see, the, being in pulmonology we are seeing any presentation anything and from march to august what sneha madam says is any dehydration watch out yes that is one thing and giving them one a uh, bit of either ors or salt to be applied to the tongue and all that you know all this is new and aquagenic wrinkling as a uh, screening test as madam said we are doing for many suspicions it is just only for a suspicion and then we come and we had one child who was referred from outside almost similar to that but bigger child because they could not afford the enzymes and when we examine he had such a firm liver he is already gone into a total cirrhosis and everything at the age of 2 and a half and but he never had many symptoms he never had loose stools nothing he had occasional wheeze and somebody is really well with but then when we had the firm liver we found that he is already gone and unfortunately last year in covid we could not trace him we went on calling and finally we knew that we have lost him so another point i think what dr anthony sir said 100% the nutrition 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 because in uk if people are surviving to the fourth and fifth decade easily it is because they concentrate so much of nutrition and you read the literature that nutrition is the important we give importance and it is wonderful i enjoyed i learned 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 a lot and as sir says we keep learning every day thank you so much for this wonderful session and the uh, pgs i think she had little tension so she was changing the slides frequently to up and down anvita i think she was a little stressed with the thing 
so she was uh, thing otherwise it was a wonderful session thank congratulations to the pgs and the moderators and the trainers thank you just thank one you. final comment on anvita she is a brilliant post graduate yes sir there is and she has done an extremely good job i, yes, I must compliment her right but i don't know i told her i am not going to interfere with you at all in spite of that she was trembling i don't know right no sir it's only her fingers possibly she was just uh, moving only the fingers like the slides went on changing so we didn't know like yeah. what slides was trying to otherwise it was wonderful she put brilliant, it on beautifully brilliant. and she put it so short and nice like not too yeah. many you know the points and all were very clear on that so very nice that is come anita well done anita keep it up uh, dr janani shankar yeah Well, yeah i think uh, it was a wonderful presentation i think as uh, all the three uh, um, uh, dr sbs dr antony and dr sneha mentioned we've had children with severe anemia we've had children with chest edema and hypovolemia we've had children with rash uh, like something like an acute dermatitis enteropathica in the past where we have diagnosed cystic fibrosis so i think the message uh, was given by dr sbs it was very very clear the post graduate should realize that it will not come with a respiratory and a gi and uh, they'll have everything under the sun for making a diagnosis thank you we enjoyed the session yeah thank you madam now it's from pg side that run with us you will please your uh, feedback comments anvita anvita yes sir yes sir thank you sir thank you for the opportunity i said sorry sir there was a technical problem with the thing uh, so slides were going on On and off. What about your video? What about you're not showing your face? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. Smile, smile. For a change. Yeah. Good. Good. Well done. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, done well. Very well. Very well. Yeah, Anvita. Very well done. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, and because of IAP TNC, I thank uh, Dr. Uh, SP sir. Uh, SP sir, you uh, have done excellent uh, chairperson as well as moderator role also. I thank uh, Dr. Snega uh, from the CMC Valor. I thank Dr. Anthony and uh, for that excellent moderation. I thank uh, really as uh, Dr. SP said, you know that uh, KKCT post graduates have done very well, uh, particularly Dr. Anvida. I thank uh, Anandal for this uh, wonderful opportunity given to IAPT and SC. I thank the Swetha as a DIP person to help us. Thank you, thank you, Anandal.